All righty, world history students, welcome to our second lecture uh, related to uh, ancient Greece. And this is going to be uh, focusing on the culture of reason. Um, we mentioned in the Iliad, the Homer and the Iliad uh, lecture, uh, that this is one of the major themes or values implicit in those Greek epics. And we're going to focus on it more intently because it, it goes way beyond just um, uh, the rhetoric and what, you know, what we see in the, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So let's talk about reason, Greek reason. Uh, the first section, I want to just highlight three thinkers. You're going to be doing readings uh, for each of these uh, Greek thinkers. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here because you're going to do the readings and answer more questions there. Uh, but the first I'll just mention is Hippocrates. Uh, maybe you've heard of the Hippocratic Oath that many those those in the medical profession take um, to do no harm. Uh, this that that's related to this early Greek physician named Hippocrates, and what he represented was that he looked for natural causes to uh, uh, physical illness, and that you know there were physical behaviors and illnesses and sicknesses that a lot of times had been given superstitious or religious causes. Hippocrates was somebody, a Greek thinker, who said, you know what, I want to find a natural cause. I want to find a natural cause and maybe a natural cure, and not just attribute something that we see and, and that's mysterious to the gods or to the supernatural. Um, and that really is at the crux of what Greek reason represents is an attempt to take what is unknown and seemingly unexplainable and to say, no, I'm going to use my humanistic potential. I'm going to use my reason and that my uh, powers of observation and logic to uh, better understand the truth uh, about the world and understand it rather than just, you know, write it off as something mystical or supernatural. Um, Thucydides takes that same mindset and applies it to history. Thucydides is the most famous historian of the ancient world. Uh, he's many times considered the first or in some ways the second historian. I won't get into that, but his history of the Peloponnesian War, which we'll talk about later, a civil war um, among the Greek uh, city-states, uh, was is, is, again, very, very well done. It's very, very objective. Um, it's, it has a lot of facts. He interviewed witnesses. He tried to find eyewitnesses. He tried to explain what was going on when two different sides described the same event differently. Um, and he, again, he didn't want, uh, he said history shouldn't be a bunch of myth. It shouldn't be full of bias. It shouldn't even just be for entertainment. Um, it should, it should just be the truth. It should be like an accurate, objective account of what happened. And so again, like Hippocrates, he's trying to take something that gets wrapped up in kind of myth telling or, um, uh, just excitement or emotion and strip it down to know what it what is the actual accurate account of the truth of what happened um, and so yeah, he again applying Greek reason to uh, uh, recording the, the recording of history the writing of history and third we have a, a, a man named Critias um, and Critias was famous because he took this uh, to the extent uh, kind of the next I won't say logical extent, but the next step of saying, well, you know what, if we're trying to find kind of natural reasons and natural explanations for um, all of life, and this is coming from human reason, why why do we even need the gods? And Critias was kind of a famous ancient atheist who said, you know what, gods aren't, the gods aren't real. In fact, the gods are just the invention of man's reason, and they're a tool to control human beings, and that we just tell uh, people about that there's gods and there's eternal punishment and that they they weigh you know our behavior and our morality in the in the balance of the scales in order to strike fear into our hearts and to uh, control us you know and I think you, you know, his that spirit is definitely alive and well today um, and it's easy to kind of imagine and fall into that mindset and so he said he was kind of the first to say you know what there is no supernatural it's all natural and we just make up the supernatural stuff um, in order to control other people um, What's kind of scary is 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 the is he also reached the conclusion of that. We're going to talk about that because the danger when you remove uh, the divine or the revealed law, all there is is the human law. And if there's no divine right or wrong, well then who decides what right or wrong is? Uh, Critias said, well you know what that it just might. In other words, the strongest person, the mightiest person, is the one who gets to decide what is right and wrong. Because how else are we going to decide? It's just your opinion or my opinion or your religion's opinion or my religion's opinion. Um, and it was in that mindset that Critias was actually um, a very violent fellow. He becomes a tyrant of a city and he murders and slaughters his opponents and his, the supporters of his opponents um, because there's no moral reason not to. Um, he's in charge and he gets to decide what's right and wrong. And there's no more this inhibition of gods and their view of things holding him back. And so we'll be exploring that, that kind of a, he rep kind of represents a dark side of reason uh, because uh, he's so 
is so enamored with what man is capable of, he doesn't realize what can happen if that's all we, we look at in making our decisions. Um, so let's just look a little more uh, specifically at this idea of reason um, uh, uh, right now. The, uh, what the Greeks really believed, or I would, you know, it has become commonplace in Western civilization that reason is what sets human being apart. Um, it sets our ability to think and search through and logically argue for or discover what the truth of something is. We have the ability to investigate. We have the ability to observe. We have the ability to uh, look for connections and, and kind of answer the questions of how and why. Um, we want to know what is the truth of our reality. When we see weather patterns, when we see sickness, or when we see uh, something happening, we want to know, well, why is that happening? And reason is the tool that allows us to investigate that. Um, one of the themes that we'll be looking at is, again, the idea that is that reason is, one, very powerful. Um, and it's extremely transformative. And again, it's one of the pillars of Western civilization. Revelation 1, uh, kind of embodied in the giving of the revealed law to the Jews by God at Mount Sinai, creating kind of a, a moral uh, monotheism where mankind doesn't decide what is right and wrong, but God does. Um, and then human reason, our ability to then independently investigate and understand those things. But along with its power is the ability for us, as I kind of gave to that example of Cotias, its limits and also its ability to be corrupted. Um, I'm also going to argue that just because we have this idea of reason and our ability to think and discern the truth, that doesn't immediately mean, well, that means you're going against the supernatural. The, the conclusion of a reasonable mind doesn't have to be that there is no God or that there is nothing supernatural. Um, and we're going to look at that over the next few minutes. Um, benefits. So what are the benefits of reason? Well, when you use reason, you actually know reality. You actually know what's truth. When you look at your grades in a class, if you view it reasonably, you'll actually understand, wait, no, here's why I'm failing, or here's why I'm doing well, or here's what works and here's what doesn't work. Um, you're getting sick. Well, what, what am I eating? How am I behaving? What, what virus have I contracted that's actually reasonably causing this? It's, it's powerful when you know the truth because then you can take steps that will actually have a reasonable effect. You're not just throwing up prayers or making sacrifices or doing superstitious things. You know, it's a, you know, if I knock on wood before I take a test, then I'm going to pass it or whatever it is, or I'm going to wear my lucky shoes to this basketball game. No reason says, no, let's find the natural things that actually work. And then when we do those, we're going to find success. So you better understand the world. You better understand yourself. Um, and you're no longer chained to lies. You don't have, you don't have misconceptions that you where you think something's true. And it's not. And so then you actually begin to fail uh, and suffer because of it. And so the Greeks really saw reason as key to unlocking, as it says, there, a healthy, happy, productive life. And that if we want to reach our potential, we need to know the truth about ourselves, about our society and about the world, the natural world around us. Uh, what then are the limits of reason? Well, again, once you kind of unlock something, you realize oh, this is really powerful. Uh, I could do anything with this. Well, Let's apply reason to that idea. Um, three main ideas. Number one is reason should tell us, I believe, when accurately used, is that we will never know everything. That real reason, as amazing and as powerful as it is when we build the faster you know, microchip or when we one day go and colonize Mars, um, as powerful as that is, reason would also demand humility. Because when you really consider what you know versus what you don't know, you would sit there and have to honestly say, you know what, there's a lot my, what I know is a speck of black on an, a giant ocean of a whiteboard. Um, it's, it's, a, it's great, but it's nothing compared to what I don't know. And in, so, in some sense, the more you do know, uh, the more you should acknowledge how much more there still is that you don't. Um, or even as I've written there, uh, it's true reason would say, there, if there's a God, I'm definitely not, not him. Because there's, there's more than I can handle, more knowledge out there than I can handle. Uh, the other limit of reason is just that we're biased, that many times our reason, when we say, I'm, I'm trying to give a reasonable answer, I'm trying to understand them, it becomes corrupted by our own perspective, or maybe even just limited by our own perspective. We can't see everything from every angle. Um, we can't always have access to all the facts, and so we're going to make a biased decision. Or we have desires, we have motives. You know, I believe that because I like what it says about me. I believe that because it tells a story that I want to be true. I, 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 I you know, Etc. You know, a lot of people who say they're atheists, they're not really atheists because they're objectively convinced there's no God. They're atheists because they don't want there to be a God. And they found some reasons that they could, they, you know, some rationalized thinking that says, okay, well, I can live with myself not wanting there to be a God because I've got these, these reasons. 
um, but it's not necessarily um, honest. There's a lot of bias uh, applied to our reason a lot of times. And also just that we're flawed. This kind of gets to maybe what I was already kind of saying there. Bias is kind of this conscious effort to uh, skew the facts or interpret the, the facts uh, for our own benefit. But being flawed just means we make mistakes. Sometimes you are absolutely positive. You're being unbiased and you're applying everything you've learned. And all of a sudden, it still doesn't work out. You still miss the math problem and you still crash the car, though you were driving as safely as you could. Uh, but you you made a mistake and you were flawed. You, your thinking had a hole in it. And that's just, that's again, that's some, another reason why reason has a limitation and why an honest uh, uh, measuring of our reason should actually keep us humble uh, because we realize, no, I'm going to make mistakes in my, in my attempt to understand things. And then that just takes us to kind of this third idea that I already brought up, and that is reason and faith. In other words, this reason, this ability to think and logically prove or argue our way to discern the truth, uh, is it still allowed, does that leave room for faith? In other words, to to take, base something not on pure observation and absolute proof, but to just extend that. I, I want to believe or I choose to believe that even though I don't have 100 percent proof. I don't know of it 100 percent. Is there a crossroads between faith and reason? Uh, this is a, uh, a quote by Voltaire, who is actually a very famous um, enlightenment thinker and a lot of times chastised for being anti-God or anti-religion. But uh, that's a little too generic characterization of him we'll be bringing him up again in the in the third quarter when we talk about the enlightenment in the 1700s but here's something he said he said what is faith is it to believe that which is evident in other words that you can see no it's perfectly evident to my mind that there exists a necessary eternal supreme and intelligent being this is no matter of faith but of reason and what he's basically saying there is uh, i believe there's a god so a lot of people think he was an atheist, but now he goes, I believe there was, there's a God. Do I accept this on faith? And he says, no, I actually believe there's a God for all of these logical reasons. I believe it's more reasonable to believe there's a God uh, than there isn't. And so he, something you would associate with faith, a lot of times there's a lot more reason to it than you might think. Um, this is just an example of what he's talking about. You know, how could you conclude the supernatural using reason? Well, uh, famous, and this is this is actually an argument that goes back a millennia uh, to the early church fathers, but this idea that all things result from a cause. In other words, nothing creates itself. Something cause it has caused everything to happen. Uh, then they argue that the universe had a cause. It came from somewhere. It hasn't always been around. That's been debated, but now scientifically, we're, we're pretty confident that that is in fact the case. Um, the universe, when we say the universe, that includes everything physical, everything natural. In other words, there's nothing physical or natural outside of the existing universe. Well, if all things have a cause, then the universe has to have a cause. Then therefore, all natural things have a cause. That means there must be something unnatural or supernatural that brought about the creation of the universe. Um, in other words, whatever created this natural universe um, uh, has to be something that's not natural itself or that what else would be part of the universe. It must be something supernatural. Therefore, there is a supernatural thing beyond the physical universe that brought it into being because it couldn't have done it itself. Um, and they say, well, basically that is whatever that supernatural creator of the universe is, let's call that God. It doesn't necessarily prove there was a Jesus or doesn't prove that the Bible's true. But as far as saying, well, I believe there's a God of all creation, that can, is actually a very reasonable argument. And it, it implies some faith where you where you go from that. But, but um, I think that's what Voltaire and many people would say is there is a tight intersection. Uh, and this is what a ap Christian apologetics is all about uh, for explaining and that uh, using your reason, in fact, should point you to the reality of the supernatural, not uh, be like Cotias and say, well, no, this means we don't, there must not be anything uh, beyond the physical. Um, QED is just Latin for it's been proved, demonstrated. And again, you can play with this, this argument, but it's a pretty sophisticated argument. Um, another interesting thing uh, that I'd like to point out in that if you read the, the Gospel of John, and if you read the first verses and you get the famous uh, ones where it says on the left, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and God was the word. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. Well, that's a lot of people. That's that's the word logos or the word logos. Wherever you read the word, uh, wherever you read the word word, 
And a lot of you know Christians understand that to be referring to Jesus. But what that word actually logos means is this word reason. And so you could also read John 1 in, as it is on the right. In the beginning was reason, and the reason was with God, and reason was God. And he was with God in the beginning, and through reason all things were made. Without him nothing has been made that has been made. In reason is life, and that life uh, is the light of all mankind. So in other words, there's an argument to be made, and I believe there's this key biblical intersection between reason and Jesus himself, and that there's something foundational about our world that, again, everything in our world has been made through logic and reason, and therefore us being created in the image of God, we can use this ability to think and talk to unlock and master and read uh, the world, because it's basically saying, no, this world is not enchanted. This world is not just magical and random and superstitious and inhabited by spirits uh, that control things. No, it's actually a reasonably created, almost like a clock or a machine of some kind that we humans have the, the mental faculties to begin to tinker with and to move and go, okay, I get why that happens. Hey, let's change this and create this and to manipulate and hence uh, take dominion over. Um, and you can see that right there in this, in this um, passage where uh, the Bible asserting the universe was made in a certain way and it being very well tied into this idea that reason and our ability to interpret that uh, is, is tied right into it. Um, and don't worry, I'm not saying that that you're, there's no Jesus and, you know, making uh, reason into some kind of antichrist. Um, the, the, the word logos goes much deeper than that. But for, for this purposes, uh, we can see there's a, a powerful intersection between even biblical uh, narratives of how the, the world was made and the, the power of reason to understand it. Um, I think we have something similar with, with Solomon. If you've ever read Ecclesiastes, Solomon, again, considered, according to the Bible, one of the wisest men or the wisest man to ever live. He talks about in Ecclesiastes all the different ways in which he searched for, for the truth and the meaning of life and what's good in life. And he goes through all sorts of the ways, things that men could experience, uh, whether it's uh, mental under, you know, knowledge and understanding, whether it's physical enjoyment, whether it's wealth and power, uh, you know, physical pleasure, all these things. And he comes to this vast search for what life is all about. His conclusion is here in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And he says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. In other words, he, through his reason and his observed experiences of life, goes, you know what the smartest thing you could do in life is you should fear God. You should fear God and keep his commandments. In other words, the smartest, most reasonable thing you can do, have faith. And so there's this powerful intersection between reason and faith. And this is why Western civilization has married these two things together. They do kind of different things um, and they're different kind of poles within the tent, but they don't contradict. They don't they don't uh, activate against one another. Again, it's very reasonable to know that knowledge has limits. And it's very reasonable then to turn to faith and say, you know what? Uh, if all I if I become the source of my own wisdom and I become the source of my own knowledge of good and evil, that's going to destroy me and destroy others around me. Um, so the smartest thing I could do is put my faith in God and keep his commandments. At least that's what the, the smartest man in the world concluded. So I don't know if I want to challenge that. And here's just another beautiful quote. Let me see if I can move this that I think also encapsulates this as we bring it to a close. And this was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, Sir William Bragg, in the early 20th century. He said, Christianity and science are opposed. You know, because a lot of people see like Christianity and science or Christian faith and reason to be fighting against each other. And he goes, yeah, they're opposed. But he goes, only in which the same way they, that my thumb and forefinger are opposed. They face each other and they do, they do different things. They do different things. But between the two of them, I can grasp everything. This quote really embodies what uh, Western Civ is all about. But I believe uh, that the, the, the culture that was derived from the Judeo-Christian and Greco-Roman uh, values and principles has brought such prosperity, freedom, and glory to the world is because between reason and faith or revelation, reason and revelation, they're like a finger, a forefinger and a thumb that are opposed to each other, but together they're able to grasp everything that we need in life. Um, and so... Uh, contrary to being uh, harmful to each other, they're actually self-reinforcing. Okay, so so what? Let's bring this. Let's wrap this up. Reason leads us to truth and reality. 
we, uh, the Greeks, you know, have left the legacy of saying, you know what, if we look at things objectively and through logic and facts and observation rather than just myths and stories and all these other things, we're going to be able to live better and happier and more productive lives. Uh, we looked at examples of how they applied this in medicine, uh, history, um, politics, but also in math and biology. You know, that's why we have all these, you know, things like the Pythagorean theorem, these Greek names, uh, because they, they discovered a lot of truths that continue to be uh, represented the building blocks of modern knowledge. Um, but it's also really key to recognize its limits. Uh, it's reasonable to let, to recognize the limits of reason. Um, you don't know everything. I don't know everything. I'm not God. And that it can, it's a very reasonable argument to turn to the supernatural. It's a very reasonable argument to resort to faith. Um, we could talk about that for a long time, but understanding the, the limits of it, even as you celebrate, even, even as the Greeks did, and we'll talk about this, the amazing potential of human beings and what we can do with reason, we should realize also the humility that reason uh, truthfully demands. Okay, look forward to discussing some of this with you guys in class. Uh, hope you enjoyed.